Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today I'm going to try and talk to you about an introduction to dog and cat nutrition. For anyone that's followed the topic, you'll know that it's a little bit controversial and a little bit stressful because any time a vet on social media tries to talk about dog and cat nutrition, you inevitably get somebody come along to basically yell at you and insist that vets know nothing about nutrition, that you only get one or two hours of nutrition education through your whole course, or that you're being paid off by large food companies, or that you're deliberately feeding dogs and cats in such a way to make them sick. And like, it's just not a nice thing to have to talk about on the internet, particularly because we don't deserve to be spoken to that way. Nobody is deliberately trying to make a pet sick, we're just trying to cover the basics and do our job. So let's try and talk about the basics, but I will probably have to split this into a multi-part series because, uh, well, let's see how long we run. There are lots and lots of commercial diets available today for dogs and cats, uh, particularly with a lot of social media advertising and a lot of these foods are not available in brick and mortar stores. I think probably every other month somebody will come into the clinic and they are feeding something to their pet that I've never heard of. Uh, and I just can't keep up with all the trends, what's new, what's changed in the market, because a lot of these companies don't promote themselves to vets at all. They advertise directly through social media to pet owners and if they don't send a, an email or something to the clinic, I don't necessarily know that food exists because I'm not going into pet stores very often I can order just about everything I need online. So in the face of so much advertising and so much choice, how do you make a decision about what food you want to feed your pet? Part of it's going to be based on personal preference. Thanks, Dingus, very charming. Uh, some of it will be based on medical concerns. And I will talk in a separate video about feeding for particular medical conditions because Otherwise, this will be too long. Uh, and partly your budget will also determine what you feed your pet because we have to be realistic. You're feeding it every day and you also have the rest of your family to feed, not just a fur baby. So I will talk about how to understand a pet food label, a little bit about macronutrients and micronutrients and what they are, um, dry matter percentage versus ad fed, as fed because that changes what's on the label. Uh, a little bit about AAFCO food standards and different life stages. Uh, a couple of meaningless phrases you might see on packets. A couple of phrases that do actually mean something useful. And we might go through a couple of examples. Hi, Dickers. So what are macronutrients? Macronutrients are the things in food that are fed in the largest quantities. So they're typically measured in grams or kilograms. So that's water, which is by far the most common thing, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Most of what you're gonna focus on is the fat and protein content because carbs are not exactly filler. You still get nutrients and energy from them, but you can only have four things in food, water, protein, fat, and carbs. If you take out the water, like in dry food, you're left with protein, fat and carbs. And most nutrition labels will only list the protein and the fat, which means everything else should be carbohydrate. Canned food is different because that could be 70 or 80% water. And if it doesn't list a moisture content, you either need more information or you're guessing. Firstly, water. A lot of water is actually eaten rather than drunk particularly if you're feeding a moist food, like a canned food or a loaf, or you can straight up add water to food. Uh, it doesn't change the nutritional value, it just changes the hydration. Uh, it's often listed as moisture on the feed analysis, and that's why you get a difference between as fed nutrition, which includes the moisture, or dry matter percentage, which does not include the moisture, it's dry. Next, we have protein, uh, which is used for muscle and organ function. 
and it is super important. It contains various different amino acids that dogs and cats need in different ratios. And that is not part of an introduction to nutrition. That is much more advanced nutrition. Different sources of protein will have different compositions. Different sources of protein are more digestible than others. And some protein is going to be more useful for a cat than others are. Fat is, um, it's not the devil. Dogs and cats do need some fat in their diet. They don't need massive amounts of it. They still need more protein than fat, but you don't want to exclude it completely because it contains essential fatty acids and it carries with it a lot of the fat soluble vitamins. Generally, I think liquidy fats at room temperature are going to be a healthier choice than solid fats at room temperature. But that really only matters if you're cooking food at home. And then carbohydrates are also not the devil, but they are cheap. <laughs> they are high in energy. Uh, they don't carry a lot of extra nutrients with them like the protein and the fat does. Uh, and some people will just say, oh, they're filler. They do nothing, which is not quite true. They are easily ut utilizable energy which for a very active animal is great. You do need some carbs, but they also include the non-digestible carbohydrates, which is fiber, which helps them to poop. And some dogs in particular will need more fiber than, is what in, than what is in their normal food because otherwise they get constipated or they get anal gland problems. So there are certain high quality diets with no fillers that I end up having to ask clients to add some fillers too, so the dog can poop. <laughs> then micronutrients are things that are measured in milligrams. They're still very important, but in a much smaller dose. Things like calcium and phosphorus, um, sulfur, all those sorts of elements, all of your essential vitamins and minerals are micronutrients, essential fatty acids, and particularly for the cats, we look at taurine, linoleic and linoleic acids, which is why cats should not be vegan. All of these get specified in AAFCO feeding standards or feed profiles. They tell you the minimum percentage that you need in the diet for everything, every protein, every amino acid, different fats, fatty acids, everything that has a minimum or a maximum, they will have. Uh, and that's, they're quite detailed documents. And if you are in the supermarket or the pet store, you probably don't want to think about them at all. You probably just want to think about crude protein, crude fat, maybe moisture percentage, depending on what sort of information is on the label. And you're looking for the phrase complete and balanced. Because if the label says complete and balanced, it should subscribe to the AAFCO feeding standards. If it says supplementary feed, complementary feed, or intermittent feeding, it's a treat. It's not going to be adequate to feed them every day forever. It's just a little treat, an occasional food. So I'll pop the AAFCO guidelines for protein and fat for both dogs and cats up on the screen in a moment. For both adult maintenance levels and for growth and reproduction, which is puppies, pregnant and lactating individuals. Uh, the protein levels for adult dogs is recommended to be at least 18%, but there's some discussion that anything over 30 is possibly not great. Uh, while cats seem to be about 26% minimum, so they have a much higher baseline protein requirement, but it's still not 100%. Diets will vary in how much protein and fat they have because fat is delicious, animals love it, uh, but protein is the expensive one. And not all proteins are created equal. So proteins vary in terms of how digestible they are and how bioavailable they are. Protein is usually described as crude protein on the label, which is not always just protein. It's actually a 
usually a mathematical calculation based on how much nitrogen is in the food because all proteins have nitrogen in them and it's just fancy maths. You chemically treat the food, you measure how much nitrogen is, the, is in there and you do some math. That's cheap. The uh, better way to measure it is to measure how much nitrogen is in the food and then how much nitrogen is in the poo and you figure out how much nitrogen that animal actually used. That's expensive. Uh, and analysing the amino acid composition of the food is expensive. And analysing the amino acid concentration in the blood after an animal has eaten the food is expensive. So most companies won't do that. So if you're measuring crude protein based on nitrogen content of the food, you can cheat, which is why there was that controversy a few years ago where um, certain manufacturers in China were adding melamine to human infant formula. The chemical formula of melamine is C3H6N6. So that's quite a lot of nitrogen per molecule. And when you test the formula, you test the milk, it reads as being much higher in protein. So they got more money for it. And melamine causes kidney disease or kidney failure, which is why everyone was very upset with that. So you can add things to food that read as false protein. Uh, in particular, other than obviously toxic things like melamine, legumes and beans might be a problem. We already know the protein in those vegetable sources is less bioavailable to dogs and cats than animal proteins. So meat, fish, great. Legume, beans and spinach, eh, only about half as good. And if they have more proteins they're not metabolizing well, that might be worse for their kidneys. But a lot of foods that go, oh, we're grain free, are not actually high meat. They just replace the grains with legumes. So it reads as higher protein, but that protein might not actually be useful, particularly for cats, but there was possible issues with anti-nutrients in the legumes causing nutrients to not be absorbed properly that otherwise would have causing dilated cardiomyopathy particularly in certain dog breeds so you probably don't want plant-based protein you do want animal-based protein which for a future topic I'll talk about low allergen diets and food elimination trials but not in the introduction video now for shorthand, when you're at the pet store and you're trying to decide on a food, there's a few phrases you want to look for on the packet to make your life a little bit easier. The first is complete and balanced. So that means that that food should follow the AAFCO feeding rules about macronutrients and micronutrients. So it should have everything in roughly the right ratios enough to sustain life if you fed that food and nothing else but that food for a whole 12 months. If it says complementary, occasional feeding or supplementary feeding, it will not do that. It is just a tasty treat. If you see the VOHC symbol, the Vet Oral Health Council, that says that the food has actually done some studies to be helpful for dental health. So that symbol actually means something. On the other hand, if it just says dental and doesn't have that symbol, that's not a regulated phrase. Anybody can say dental. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna do anything. Just because it's a dry food does not necessarily mean it's good for teeth. Uh, organic is another one that means nothing. Not regulated for pet food. Just sounds expensive. Same with natural. What does that mean? Nothing really. Uh, and a few phrases that have meaning but are not necessarily what you think they are are things like flavour, as in beef flavour. It will have beef in it, but it might not be beef based or beef exclusive. So for a dog with allergies, that's not helpful. And with meat, sure, there's some there, but it's not necessarily most of what's there and again for an allergy dog that might not be very helpful 
So let's work through a couple of examples, which unfortunately means it's time for maths. I've grabbed the nutritional information for a couple of dog food brands that are all uh, reasonably common in Australia, and we'll have a quick look at them. Uh, the first one is actually Lucky Dog, which is a cheaper brand that lists a average analysis crude protein of 17% and crude fat of 10%. Uh, that would mean that the protein is actually a bit lower than the AA FCO guidelines and the fat is a little bit higher. Not ridiculous though. Like it'll probably do, but it's not great long term. Uh, the next one is very popular four legs, uh, which is like a refrigerated meaty ball type food. Now, its website is really useful because it gives us as fed nutrition to compare it to dry matter nutrition because this is a moist food. So as fed, the crude protein is 11.3% and the crude fat is 8%, which doesn't sound too fatty, but the moisture is 67% which means that things that are not water are 33% of the food. So if we divide the 11.3% protein over the 33% that is not water, we get 34.2% protein, which is quite high protein. But if you divide the 8% fat over the 33% not water, you get 24% fat, which is quite a lot of fat. But yes, it can cause pancreatitis. But it didn't look like it was high fat when you left the moisture in there, which is why the dry matter is what you really want to look at. And unfortunately, that sometimes means doing quick maths in the supermarket. The last one I grabbed was Black Hawk Adult Lamb and Rice, because that is very popular. Uh, it will tell you straight up it's a dry food, it's got 25% protein, which is plenty, and 17% fat, which is okay for most dogs that don't have a pancreatitis history. Uh, and it does list multiple different sorts of meat. So it is a uh, lamb and rice food, but it also has chicken in it uh, and fish. So while it's fine for a normal dog, if you were trying to do an allergy diet because you thought your dog was allergic to chicken, nope. <laughs> we will talk about feeding for allergies in a different video. Um, I hope those examples make sense for how to look for foods that are secretly much higher in fat and why the dry matter matters and a little bit about how to read the labels. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free to drop them into a comment below and I will try to get to them in future videos because nutrition is quite a big topic that unfortunately does involve a lot of maths. But the short version when you're trying to make a decision is look at the protein and the fat first look for complete and balanced. Hopefully there's something on the packet that says AAFCO guidelines or AAFCO standards and go from there. Then you can look at the ingredient list and decide whether you're happy with what's in it or not and whether it suits your budget. My name is Dr. Ferox. Thank you for watching this video. Hopefully none of you are yelling at me about being an incredibly biased veterinarian and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.